Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the latest episode of Performer on Record. I am your host. My name is Ben. I'm the editor of Performer Magazine. If you're not familiar with us, uh, I encourage you to head over to performermag.com. We are uh, a trade publication for musicians and audio professionals. Uh, we publish uh, a print magazine bi-monthly uh, here in the United States, and we also obviously run the website performermag.com along with all of the associated social media channels. So if you're a musician looking for, you know, tips on the music business or recording advice, um, head on over to the site, check out a print copy and uh, see what we're all about. That being said, this is episode eight of our podcast series, Performer on Record, and we have a really great guest for you today. Um, we actually featured her on a couple of video series that we did recently uh, with some AKG and JBL home studio gear. Uh, if you haven't guessed by the title of the podcast already, her name is Devin. She's a wonderful uh, East Coast singer songwriter, and she used the gear in those videos to um, help record her latest single, Glitter, which we've also premiered on our homepage. So again, head on over to the Performer Magazine website, give a listen to Glitter, head on over to our YouTube channel, and uh, check out that video series that Devin helped us put together. Some really cool looks at uh, some AKG microphones, JBL studio monitors, and some other gear that she used uh, to actually make that track. There's a whole behind the scenes component, which is really cool. If you've been paying attention, uh, you'll remember in our last episode, I sort of teased a little bit about some of the things I've been doing uh, while I've been kind of working from home during this, uh, well, never-ending 2020, even though it's 2021 now, and uh, sort of mentioned one of my favorite musical formats, uh, sort of teased that out. And uh, today I do want to talk a little bit about that because I've seen a resurgence lately in interest. Uh, and of course, I'm talking about the mini disc. Um, I think most people who know me probably figure that, you know, uh, vinyl is my favorite format. And yeah, to a certain degree, it definitely is. You know, I have a strong emotional attachment to records. Um, my record collection is, you know, one of my most prized possessions. But there's something futuristic and retro at the same time that kind of draws me to mini disc. And over the quarantine period, um, I've definitely been kind of diving back in and reacquainting myself um restored uh, a couple of non-functioning decks it had uh been lying around here the sony je330 um which is a really kind of if you're looking to get into mini disc and you want a home hi-fi unit i would say that's a great place to start because it's not expensive um, they're fairly easy to maintain. They'll last a long time. And it's actually one of the later decks from the 90s. So it's got the better compression uh, schematic on it. So it's, I think, A-Track version 1, revision 4.5 or something. It gets a little muddy with all of the revisions. And, and A-Track not standing for A-Track, like the cassette cartridge. A-Track, A-T-R-A-C, which was the um, compression format that Sony used. Actually, I think they still used it up and through uh, the PlayStation era. Um, but that was their proprietary take on, you know, something like the MP3, for example. But for my money, it definitely sounds better than MP3. I think a standard recorded uh, mini disc uh, blows MP3 out of the water. In many cases, it's nearly indistinguishable from the source um, and really should have taken off as the successor to, you know, the audio cassette for, for home recording. And I don't mean home recording in the studio sense like recording your own music for commercial release i mean recording um copies of let's say records or cds or something off the radio that sort of thing um it was smaller it sounded better it offered much more flexibility as far as re-recording um reshuffling tracks actually titling tracks with text so it would display on the player um, there was just a whole host of reasons why it was better and a whole host of reasons why it didn't take off. Um, for me, as, as a teenager in the 90s, uh, it was just far too expensive. You know, I could buy a tape for 75 cents, blank tape, and, and record anything I wanted. I could copy my friend's CDs. I could record stuff off the radio. I could copy a record, whatever, and it was cheap. And, and yes, those were type 1 uh, tapes because type 4 was expensive even back then. Uh, now you're lucky to get a type 4 new old stock tape for under 30 bucks but mini disc by comparison was just unobtainable to the average kid uh, an average music lover um decks that came out early on with with kind of the earliest revisions of the a track uh, compression ran at least five hundred thousand uh, dollars blank discs were i seem to remember being at least 20 bucks a piece which was 
you know, for the 60 minute format later, they bumped it up to 80 minutes and you could get them for about, you know, a buck or two at the, you know, uh, tail end of the life cycle. But, you know, here in America, they just never really took off. There's still an enthusiast community uh, around them. You can still buy blanks. Uh, Sony still has kind of one remaining skew in stock uh, that's in Japan that you can get from Amazon Japan for pretty cheap. Um, I think under two bucks a disc, which is not bad. If you hop on some of the auction sites, um, you can get big bundles of blanks uh, either wiped clean or, you know, still with people's old recordings on them that you can just wipe clean yourself, you know, for 75 cents to two bucks a disc uh, if you buy like a hundred lot or something. And most of the Japanese sellers who deal with American buyers are really good at packaging and shipping out fairly quickly. So if it's something you're interested in, I would say, you know, look into it. it it's fun. It's harmless. It's just, you know, a bit of retro um, amusement, I, I guess you could say. But it is functional, too. I've I've got a ton of discs here that I've recorded um, things for archival purposes, um, podcast episodes uh, of shows that are now behind paywalls. Um, records that I've borrowed, um, rare items that I don't want to kind of handle too often, um, special radio presentations that I wanted to record for posterity. Um, and it's it's just a bit of fun. You know, you can make your own covers or, you know, templates and things for Photoshop and InDesign that you can print out and, and look really good and make your own labels for the discs. And, you know, it's just, um, for me, a way to kind of connect with something that I always wanted a a as a kid, but could never afford and then sort of disappeared from the marketplace without much fanfare. Um, Sony, at least here in the States, I think dropped the format in the early 2010s as far as production was concerned. But even by that time, they were long gone from the marketplace. Um, really, mini discs at the retail level only lasted for, I would say, from 90 to 93 when they were introduced alongside the DCC to maybe 96, 97. And after that, here in the States, at least, it was pretty much gone. It, it, it virtually vanished from shelves. I know in the UK, uh, lasted a little bit longer at retail and had a little bit more foothold in the market. If you watch some of Tech Moan's, uh video uh, segments on, on the mini disc, you'll kind of get a sense for what, what the format did over there. But yeah, here it was dead. And, and I think one of the problems is they didn't really market it as a true successor to, to cassette tapes. Um, they marketed it more as a pre-recorded format. And at that time, 93, we just had so many formats already. You know, we had CDs. Those were doing really well. Um, we had cassette tapes. You throw this new mini disc on the market. Um, there were uh, Laserdisc uh, album releases uh and video cds uh that were coming out that never really took hold and then of course you still had records i mean there were still bands pressing some records i mean by 90 91 it was pretty much dead at retail but pearl jam and nirvana two of the biggest bands of that era um definitely had lps out on the shelves um and they weren't specialty items they were just out um they might have been the only record that your local record store carried at that time but i remember you know when uh pearl jams verse came out that would have been 93 going down to my local record store they had a cd copy of it they had a tape copy of it they had uh the vinyl which i don't remember if it was a double LP set or just a single disc at that time. Uh, there have been so many reissues at this point. And then the mini disc, which was brand new and most of us you know, didn't know much about because Sony didn't do a great job with the public fanfare. But looking at four different formats, I think was just a bit much for people. There was definitely a burnout at that time as far as you know what the public consumption was uh, willing to handle as far as number of formats were concerned. When you throw four different SKUs at a marketing department and, and at the retail level and having to reconfigure shelves and convince consumers that they needed another format. And it was just kind of a no-go. So I think if they had gone the route of saying, look, CDs replaced records as your way to, to buy your favorite albums and mini discs are now replacing tapes as a way to do your home recordings, they probably could have had a little bit more success. And I think, um, gained that foothold that they were looking for prices probably would have dropped you know rapidly like we saw with dvd later in the uh, decade there 
but for whatever reason just didn't happen and obviously it was uh introduced alongside another format so now you're talking five formats on the market at once the um digital compact cassette which didn't really help things because i think there was a bit of a waiting game too amongst audiophiles you know who had invested in stereo systems and now we're looking at two new decks on the market one from phillips one from sony um which one do they want as the successor to the cassette which was on its way out anyway and i think adding all of those factors into the mix you know spelled kind of an early death for the format but that being said i did want to kind of reminisce a little bit about something that i've been having fun with maybe you can have some fun with it too um i've still got a couple blank discs left here that i'm looking to record on um i don't have any of the high md players or the net uh md players uh never really got into that I just stick with the standard version of it they did add some revisions later on up to um, a one gigabyte disc but those have become sort of a what's the word that unobtainium i guess uh they're just so expensive and the players are so hard to find now for a decent price so you can get a, a really compact cheap portable sony for like 50 bucks on any auction site or craigslist or something and the decks run less than 100 bucks so you know if you're looking to you know uh add the latest bit of hipster kit to your uh, arsenal i suppose um that's one way to do it uh i i don't foresee like a mini disc revolution like there was for for vinyl in the 2000s but hey you never know like i said bit of fun and i uh, just want to you know make good on my promise last time to bore you to death with my thoughts on uh something that i've been playing around with Anyway, that's enough of me talking. We're going to get into the interview now uh, with Devin, so stick around for that, and uh, we'll be right back. Before we jump into that interview, I do want to thank our premier sponsor, Elixir Strings, for sponsoring this podcast and each and every episode of Performer on Record. Uh, Elixir is uh, the only string that we use here at Performer because their protective coating keeps our guitar and bass strings full of life better than any other brand we'd have ever tried. And when we're reviewing stomp boxes and guitars and amps and recording gear for each uh, of our issues, we don't want anything distracting us from that job, uh, especially the hassle and expense of constantly changing out our gross, corroded strings. And believe me, I don't know what's going on with the pH in my fingers, but uh, normal, uncoated strings just don't last here in the office. Uh, and we don't want anything getting in the way of you making your music either. So say goodbye to the gross corrosion and dirt and sweat and oil buildup and use Elixir strings. Trust us, their proprietary featherweight coating acts as a really great barrier against tone killing buildup on your guitar strings, allowing you to get lost in your music. First, I think it would be great for people maybe who aren't familiar with your music just to get a little background on where you're coming from. So let's maybe take it all the way back and go to the beginning. You know, where where were you born? Where did you first get into music? And uh, we'll take it from there. Wow, that's a pretty good first concert. <laughs> that was a pretty good first concert. I think it was at like the Wells Fargo Center in Philly, but it's not a Wells Fargo Center. Um, but it was incredible. And I remember being a little kid just looking at Billy Joel on stage and thinking, yeah, I want to do that. That's it. So did that, did that cause you to start piano or, or what came first, piano or guitar? Hmm. <laughs> or both. <laughs> So did you take formal lessons or were you more self-taught or was it more of a family thing? You know, I've taken formal lessons on and on, on and off throughout my whole life. Yeah. Um, and I, they never really resonated with me because we were never playing music that I wanted to play. It was always very classical focused. Um, so I have taken formal lessons for guitar and piano and voice on and off throughout my whole life, but I've found that my best learning has been through self-taught experiments and just playing along to stuff I love and learning songs that I love and trying to imitate them. Gotcha. And that's where, uh, that, that was really when I started improving, when, when I started playing music that I really enjoyed. 
Well, I think that makes sense. A lot of people give up instruments because their teachers try to force them into things that they're not interested in. And they're like, well, I'm just going to abandon this. So I, I think it's yeah, good when absolutely. people figure out what they want to do and then go pursue that because you're never going to like something. Yeah. You know, if people are forcing you to do something that isn't in your wheelhouse. Uh, when did the vocals come along? Was that sort of all around the same time? I have always been trying to sing. And I didn't realize this, but my mom tells me now that when I was a little kid, I was completely tone deaf. I thought I was great. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I would actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it just makes sense why my mom put me in vocal lessons when I was a little kid. Because when I was a little kid... I remember coming home from pre-K four and telling my mom that I didn't like school and I wanted to drop out and be a singer. And she was like, "You're four years old. You have to stick with it a little bit longer <laughs> and get at least a high school education, preferably a college one." Um, so I stayed in school, but ever since then, my mom has been putting me on and off in in voice lessons, and I keep on again quitting, being like, "I got this. I'm so good at singing. I can just do this on my own." And my mom, my whole life, was like. Let's try another teacher. Let's try another voice. <laughs> um, but at some point, I learned how to hold a tune, and uh, and so I still think. Well, I think there's something to say about self confidence in an artist, wouldn't you? <laughs> for sure. I didn't give up on it. That's for sure because I didn't know I should. So, but it you know, my favorite. If I had known I was bad, I might have given up. But that's the thing. I think there's probably a lot of people who had the potential to be really great musicians or songwriters who didn't have that confidence and, and maybe gave up too soon. Who knows? Who knows what the world yeah. would be if people stuck with it? So Definitely. on the timeline of Devin, at a certain point, I would imagine songwriting enters the picture and you start to think, okay, well, I'm, I'm playing music and I'm, and I'm singing and stuff. Uh, maybe it's time for me to do my own songs. When, when does that start occurring? kind of been writing and trying to write silly songs since I was a little kid, but I think in middle school was when I really started enjoying poetry, and so that was when I started thinking about lyrics and, you know, listening to a lot of Counting Crows and Joni Mitchell and Sarah Bareilles and um, getting really inspired about lyrics and trying to tell a story with songs. So I think that was probably middle school is when I started really enjoying songwriting and making that a focus of mine, and that is probably my main focus to this day, I think lyrics are so beautiful and so powerful and that's the main the lyrics are the crux of my thoughts so when you sit down to write a song now is it primarily lyric based first and then music later or do you do you have like melodic ideas that you try to put lyrics to maybe take us through your songwriting process because i think for our audience i mean that's a pretty fascinating thing just to get inside the mind of an artist and kind of wrap their heads around how they work Songwriting for me has always been very lyric driven. These days it's actually kind of interesting because I, I produce all my own music too and I've been experimenting with some more um, synth based and electronic production. So I occasionally now do sit down and make a track first and see what lyric and melody ideas come after I create the track. But throughout my whole, that's more of a new thing. Throughout my whole life it's always been lyric driven first. Um, and not even melody driven, it's always been really poetry. And then building a track around that to help support the idea of the story gotcha so so now when you say you're you're maybe starting with the track first how do you find that process creatively is it is it something that you enjoy kind of putting down the music and seeing what you can fit to it lyrically is it a challenge is it something that you've actually um kind of adapted to what do you what do you think about that process I was pretty relieved when it worked. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a relief, huh? When something works. <laughs> right? I, uh, I started making tracks for this new, uh, well, for the EP I put out last year and for this new one that I'm rolling out this year, that you guys so kindly are premiering the first song, Glitter. Thank you. We are very excited about that, yes. I, um, yeah, for this project, for this, it, the two EPs are related. Um, they're kind of a series. So for these two EPs, I mostly started with the tracks first because this piece is very production driven and um, I was kind of nervous that I would make tracks that I really loved and I wouldn't be able to come up with lyrics and melodies that did them justice and I would end up having in my opinion quote unquote throwaway songs and um, that was never acting to me I didn't like that idea because when I start with the lyrics first no matter what the production does I know I'm going to love the song um, but it all worked out 
I came up with the tracks and I felt very inspired by them. And I still, uh, I have a running list of just lyric ideas whenever they come to me. So I would just listen to the track and look through my lyric ideas and pick an idea that resonated with me. So that, that gave me a starting point where I was like, okay, it's not going to be a track about nothing. I have something I want to say. Now let's just figure out how to say it with this particular music in the background. And, uh, so you've done this now for for the EP that came out and the one that's coming out. Um, do you see this as kind of the standard way that you'll produce songs going forward, or do you think you'll go back to a more lyric driven thing, or will it be more like a, a hybrid of the two processes? Processes. I don't know what the plural. For me, I think this is my new way for the foreseeable future. Cool. Um, because even though I did love my old songs and the lyrics first approach works in terms of me falling in love with the song, I think for a wider appeal, I think I'm the only person who puts this much weight on this. I think everybody else enjoys <laughs> the production. <laughs> who wants a song that feels good? And when I start with lyrics first, my production, it may not feel as cohesive for the entire project, so if you listen to the whole album and past albums, it might not feel as, it might not feel as cohesive. It might feel as cohesive. I'm not sure. I might be overanalyzing my own music. But um, I think that this, approach works better for for uh for communicating it to people who might just want to feel the music rather than listen to a poem well does that i I mean i I, I have to ask i mean does that disappoint you at all that people aren't listening to the lyrics when i mean so many songwriters not just you pour their hearts out into the words that go down on the page and then half the audience is just like yeah does it have a beat i can dance to (laughs) It's got to be disheartening <laughs> somewhat. I can, you know, it's an interesting question because I can totally see where that would be disheartening. But honestly, I don't find it disheartening at all. I'm excited whenever anyone finds any aspect of the song that brings them joy. I'm happy to be able to provide that. I think that's really cool. And even if they don't like the lyrics or if they don't listen to the lyrics, <laughs> if they enjoy the song and they listen to it enough time, they'll hear it at some point. And I, I often get people being like, oh, I listened to that song for like the fifth time today and I never noticed that funny line in the second verse. I'm like, yeah, there you go. It was there for you. It was waiting whenever you wanted to hear it. Well, fair enough. I think that's a good outlook. Not to get too disheartened. As long as people are listening to it, you know, maybe it'll sink in eventually. Yeah. Um, if not, I'm glad they could dance to it. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to talk about the production aspect um, because a lot of the folks uh, that we reach, you know, obviously they're writing their own stuff. They're recording their own stuff in better times. They're touring behind their own stuff. When you sit down to produce a track, um, do you do most of the recording in like a home studio setup? Do you do recording in a commercial space? How does that work for you? Yeah, I do my home setup uh, most actually I'm trying to think for this uh, for the last couple projects it's been exclusively in my home studio and then I use Morningstar Studios here in uh, Philadelphia area for mixing and mastering but in terms of the actual recording process it's all all in my home studio it's uh, mostly I record live acoustic guitar and um, electric guitar actually my brother Christian O'Connor plays the lead guitar on my stuff and so we actually do a proper mic amp set up in our basement and get some live lead guitar sounds but um and we do live acoustic guitars and mic it properly but everything else is kind of in the box it's all mini programming so what are you using as far as electronic stuff goes are there like favorite plugins you use favorite midi controllers anything like that okay so for a midi controller i've always just used a tiny keyboard to plug into my laptop and then during quarantine i was like you know what i want to buy myself i've never owned my own proper keyboard i've always used my dad's keyboard or just yeah my dad's keyboard that was in the house and um i was like it's covid i'm in my house for the foreseeable future i want to buy myself a keyboard (laughs) one that can be used as a nice midi programmer (laughs) midi controller so um so new for me now i use a nord um electro Ooh, very nice you didn't you didn't just buy like a 99 dollars midi keyboard you you got you got something no. good <laughs> no i bought i bought a really fun toy <laughs> and it's been it's been game changing i felt really inspired with it well sometimes so it's I nice to just treat yourself to something new right because it can really kind it of inspire really you yeah i was talking to my brother about that before i bought it because i was like this is maybe one it's one of my bigger purchases in life and uh I was nervous about it because I was like, what if it's not worth it? And my brother was saying it's always worth it. 
Um, first off, because Nord is a great band and they make incredible keyboards, but also because it's of the inspiration aspect. He was like, if you get one song out of it, it was worth it. Yeah. I mean, if it inspires you to make music, it's worth it no matter what, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, now I always support investing in an instrument or a plug-in. That was another thing. So for plugins, I just recently started um, subscribing to Output, and it's been so much fun to play with all the samples and the different sounds that they have. So again, totally worth it. What are you using for your, your DAW? Are you a Pro Tools person or are you using something else? I grew up as a Pro Tools person because my brother is a Pro Tools person. But when I started working on these last couple of EPs, I switched to Logic. Okay, cool. And I found that to be a little easier just on my laptop, on the go. Because especially since I'm doing so much programming, so I don't need as much support on live recording. Yeah. Um, Logic has been great. I I wholeheartedly recommend Logic, especially for people who maybe started out on something free like GarageBand, because Logic is essentially like GarageBand Plus. <laughs> you know, it's it's a really souped up version. So if anybody out there listening or, or reading this in print um, is is using GarageBand just for demos or something, um, Logic is way more fully capable and it's not that expensive, right? Not that expensive and it's super intuitive to use. Yeah. Cool. So you're you're doing your production um, on your own. It, is everything except um, the guitars that your brother helps you on? Is everything pretty much? Is it the all Devin all the time show <laughs> on the recordings? Yeah, everything else is all me. Do you gonna... do you foresee a point in the future where maybe there's more collaborative uh, work put into either the songwriting or the recording? I know the songwriting can be very personal for people. They don't want to let collaborators in but a lot of people who do their own writing sometimes like to kind of see what other people can bring to the table as far as the recording process goes what are your thoughts on that oh that's interesting um during quarantine i've been doing a bunch of co-writing for other people's projects which is actually that's i really enjoy that cool. writing for other people's projects and collaborating in that sense and i find i get so inspired through those sessions but right afterwards i go and write a song for my own project as well by myself after we hang up our zoom call so i love learning from other people and seeing their approach to melody and their approach to production i think it's so inspiring um i still end up writing my own stuff myself and i'm not really sure why it's not i'm not opposed to co-writing for my own project at all it's just uh none of my co-writes have ever made sense for my project so we always end up either pitching them or the other artist takes them I got you. That I mean, that makes sense. Um, Now, what do you typically do for a live show? Is it is it mostly just you on stage, or do you work with like a small band, or how does that normally work when you're when you're performing? Oh yeah, my brother's band backs me live. Oh cool. Okay. So convenient for me. (laughs) Yeah, my brother is Christian O'Connor, and he has the Christian O'Connor band, so they're a really talented rock band, and it's really fun to make them do all pop music because the. they're not, they love rap music, so it's funny when they're playing uh, cleaner sound, like cleaner tones and like more noodly guitar parts. Um, I think I think they enjoy it. It's I, a fun change of pace, but it's I also bet really they fun do. for me because it's, yeah, I hope so. But <laughs> it's fun for me because they uh, they make my songs rock live. They totally, I mean, it's all a luxury guitar. They're, they're a power trio, and then they add me in front, so. It makes me feel a little bit more like Paramore when I'm live. <laughs> do you do you find that it's easy to translate the songs that you've recorded to the stage, especially when you've got a band behind you? I overthink it way too much, and I'm like hearing that one synth part, and I'm like, oh, but who's gonna play that synth part on their <laughs> instrument? <laughs> and the guys are so good about it. They they basically they hear the song they don't listen to the like i'm overthinking every instrument i put right. into the production and they just hear the overall song and they play the overall song and i'm like oh yeah that was so simple why didn't we do that so you don't have to <laughs> radically <laughs> rearrange stuff yeah that's yeah, good radically rearranged for sure so that kind of brings us up to date what does the future hold i know we've got the glitter single coming out um but how is how yeah. is 2021 looking for you <laughs> I mean, maybe the pandemic will end. That could be cool. That would be great. But, uh, <laughs> sure. Musically, um, yeah, I have this new EP. It's called Helium. 
it's a bubbly alt pop project that I'm so excited to share. It's kind of a continuation of the Sitting Up Straight EP. So we got Glitter coming out um, March 12th. Excellent. And then we got a couple more singles and the EP hopefully in July. If not July, um, at some point this summer, but tentatively July. And then maybe by then people will be able to actually perform live again, hopefully. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> That could be fun. I would love to go to a concert. Are you looking forward to performing live again, or is it, like, not super exciting right now (laughs) as a prospect? It's a weird prospect right now, because at this point, I feel like I'm probably afraid of crowds. I haven't seen one in a while. Well, that's what I've been. That's what I've been hearing from artists. I because I've asked people like, look, if things open up again and it's safe to do so, would you look forward to getting back on stage with with a crowd? And I've heard from a lot of people be like, I don't even know if I would be comfortable. Even if everyone says, okay, now it's it's safe and we've got this under control and you can go out and do it again. I think people's mindsets have, have changed a little, which is kind of sad, a little. Yeah, a little bit. I think we'll all get back to it. We just uh, need to regain our confidence. I hope so. I hope so. Well, but, yeah, we're we're looking yeah. forward to, to the EP coming out. No, you said July-ish, but sometime this summer probably for that? Yeah, yeah I always, I pick dates. The current date on the calendar is July, uh, oh wow, now I'm going to blank. Friday <laughs> in mid-July. <laughs> well, we will look forward to that, and I know the single is coming out in March, so that'll be a good kind of way to get people excited about the EP. Is there anything else that people should know? Maybe your um, social media channels, just to throw those out there where people can find you? Definitely. I would love to keep in touch with people on social media. Um, my Instagram is Devin Sounds, and my name is Devin with an O, so D E V O N Sounds. <laughs> and that pretty much holds across everything. That holds across Twitter. Um, it holds across TikTok, but Sounds ends with a Z on TikTok. But, oh boy, uh, you're that's, get, that's you're you're one of the cool kids, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, I originally I actually enjoyed TikTok because the algorithm learns you pretty quickly and it shows you content that you want to see, but um. I just started posting on TikTok, and it's been fun doing the dance videos and stuff, but I'm excited to actually start, like, breaking down the production of Glitter and do acoustic versions of my songs and, you know, walk through the logic files and show people what I've been doing. So. Well, that's really cool. Uh, I think people get a kick out of that. Cool. So, anybody yeah, a good outlet for that kind of stuff. Anybody who wants to find you, it's at Devin Sounds, but if you're cool and on TikTok, it sounds with a Z. So that was our interview with Devin, and uh, just to quell any rumors, no, we will not be appearing on TikTok anytime soon. You would not want to see my dance moves or any of the dance moves of the performer staff. Uh, Please trust me on that. Leave it to the dancing fools on TikTok who uh, aren't going to break a hip when they uh, bust a move. So yeah, that was it. Go visit Devin online. Visit us online at performermag.com and all of our associated uh, social channels. Pick up a mini disc or two while you're at it, and we will catch you next time. Thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.